overview. I'm going to talk about what the legal duties and responsibilities are for you um, and then run through our six-step action plan so that you can get ready for GDPR. GDPR is actually the law now. It's just that there's been a two-year implementation period which comes to an end on the 25th of May and that's the point at which it becomes enforceable and potentially you could be fined if you're doing something wrong. Um, after the six-step action plan, I'm going to talk about um, a couple of things to do with marketing because everybody's mostly <coughs> interested in that, I think, um, and then conclude with a few takeaways. So, okay. The scope of the GDPR, it affects all personal data. That basically means anything by which you can identify a natural living person. So, whereas with um, the Data Protection Act, um, the scope was narrower. This includes things like biometric data, it includes um, all the IDs from your computers, any way that you can associate a living person with a piece of data that is personal to them. It affects not just their private data, but also business data. So business email addresses are a way of identifying a natural living person. So that's included as well. Um, it affects people who control the personal data, data controllers, and also people who process it. So if you have somebody else running your payroll for you, they are a data processor. You still control the data, you decide what happens to it, but somebody else is processing it. If you are a data processor for somebody else, these rules apply equally to you and um, you are equally liable. So you can't pass the buck, basically. Um, it affects not just um, people in the UK, um, it's European-wide, and it will affect businesses who hold Euro EU citizens' data. So you could be a business in America, but if you're holding EU data, then GDPR applies to those companies as well. The objectives are um, basically to protect the personal data and the rights of the, people, of the data subjects. And the whole thing is that the data controllers and data processors need to um, process that data lawfully and fairly. Now, fairly is a rather broad concept and one that's difficult to define. And the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Officer, has not actually provided guidance on exactly what fair is. So GDPR is not black and white. Um, and it also affects the free movement of personal data, which we'll touch on a bit later. OK, so who's going to enforce this? Well, it's the Information Commissioner's Officer, which is an independent body in the UK. Every member state of the EU um, will have its own uh, <coughs> leading supervisory authority. In the UK, it's the ICO, and I suspect that Patrick will talk more about the ICO later. Um, they have said it, that they are, their approach is that they're going to use a carrot rather than a stick, um, and fines are going to be proportional but effective. Okay, so I'm going to cover what your legal duties and responsibilities are. Um, I'm going to run through these items fairly quickly. You don't need to take notes or anything because all the information that I'm going to talk about today is all on our website, uh, businessclan.com forward slash GDPR. So you won't need to take any notes. Right, the first one, I'll point over there, the principles of the GDPR. Um, the principles are very similar to the Data Protection Act. Um, how many people are registered under the Data Protection Act? Um, okay. In theory, there's no registration process for GDPR, um, but in practice, you have to notify the ICO and you have to pay a fee to them so that they can operate um, the control over personal data and, in, and, uh, and do the enforcement side of the GDPR. Um, <coughs> All of these things here are pretty much similar to the, uh, to the Data Protection Act principles. So hopefully most of you are already doing a lot of this already. 
One of the big new things, however, is the accountability principle. And this is what's going to affect and impact businesses most of all, is um, implementing comprehensive but proportionate governance measures. And more than that, you're going to have to prove that you are doing that. Okay. When you process personal data, you need to have a legal basis for being able to process it. There are six legal bases. Um, some of them are under contract, some of them might be under a legal obligation. For example, if you're an accountant and you have to do money laundering checks um, on your clients, then that would be, you would need to hold that personal data under a legal obligation. Um, there are two where there are vital, you've got to process the data because of vital interests to protect the vital interests of a data subject or in the interests of a, a broader group of people under public interest. Um, so, for example, some health data might come under that um, legal basis. The two that are probably most interesting to, or uh, people want to know, need to know about for small businesses um, are the last two, consent and legitimate interest. I'm going to come back to talk about both of those a bit later on. Okay, personal data rights. Um, sorry, I've flipped over one too many. Okay, each data subject whose data you're holding has um, all of these rights associated with their data. You, as a data controller or data processor, need to make sure that their data is kept accurate, up to date, so you don't hold it for any longer than is necessary. Um, and data subjects can inquire of you and um, ask you to rectify their data. They can ask you to only use it for specific purposes um, and they can ask you to re remove or erase their data as well. Um, the, there's a new right um, under portability which um, will apply to probably larger organisations for example, if you're inputting all your data to get a quote for motor insurance, that's very time consuming. It's all the same data and um, potentially you want to give exactly the same information to another insurance broker or insurance company to get a quote. So the way that the GDPR is going to move forward is most likely that you're going to be able to port your data from one company to another. Um, and data subjects will have the right to ask for um, it, it'll probably be a CSV type file of a list of information which you can then hand on to another company. That's probably not going to affect too many of um, businesses here today, but if you want to know more about that, then ask me later. Um, in some cases, data subjects, individuals have the right to object to certain types of processing. So if you're doing profiling, if you're doing um, anything that's related to automatic decision making, um, people can object to that. However, it's not an absolute right that they can object and you have to stop. So for um, profiling, for research and statistics, if you as a business are doing that because you have a, a public interest, uh, legit, um, legal basis for processing, then that will overrule the data subject's rights. So there's a lot in the GDPR where you've got to balance the rights of the data subject um, to, the, um, to their ownership of their data um, and their interests against the opposing rights of the business and their legitimate use of the data or under any of the, those other legal bases for processing the data. The only absolute right that data subjects have um, with regard to objection is that to do with direct marketing. So if somebody objects to um, you emailing them, you've absolutely got to um, address that immediately. Okay, um, protection. I'm not going to talk a lot about this uh, because Paul from IQ and IT is going to talk about um, the protection and security side of um, looking after your data subjects' data. However, what I do want to point out here at this stage is that the level of security 
has got to be appropriate to the risk. Um, again, that is something that is not going to be black and white, and it's going to vary on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, there's also this principle uh, of proportionality, which again is that balancing of opposing interests and, and the rights of the data subjects. Um, the ICO has produced, it'll be very hard to read on here, <laughs> Uh, but 12 um, steps on how to become GDPR compliant. Um, the link to this slide is in our resource on our website, so you can find it there. But all of these 12 steps are included in our six-step action plan, which hopefully breaks it down a bit um, more, makes it a bit more manageable for businesses to accomplish. So first of all, you need to work out what you've got to do. So that's a whole lot of planning, really. Um, and I'll go through each of these steps individually. Then, once you know what you've got to do, you've got to tell your data subjects, the individuals <coughs> whose data you're holding, what it is that you're doing with their data. Then you've got to actually do what you say you're going to do. And a big part of the GDPR is um, proving your compliance, demonstrating compliance. So you've got to record how you're complying. Um, documentation is not actually um, a legal requirement under GDPR, um, but how else are you going to prove it? So I think most businesses need to do some form of record, record keeping and documentation. Um, then the next step is, once you've enacted all of that, um, if you get a complaint um, or a subject access request, which I'll talk about later, then you need to handle that well. Because basically, at the end of the day, the only way that you're going to end up with a fine is going to be if somebody complains about how you're handling their data. So as soon as you get any sign of a complaint, you need to handle that well. You need to act and respond quickly and promptly, and there are certain guidelines within the GDPR as to how quickly you've got to respond to those complaints. Um, and if you handle it well, then it's the matter's going to go no further. It's not going to reach the ICO. The ICO is not going to give you a fine. Um, so it's all about best practice. Um, and then the last step is the fact that this isn't a one-off task, unfortunately. This is an ongoing process. So every time your business systems or processes change, you've got to re-look at GDPR and how you comply with it. <coughs> right, step one. Okay, so I've broken step one into four tasks. The first task is to designate somebody within your company um, who's going to be responsible for GDPR. Um, that person does not need to have any particular qualifications, however, they do need to have certain skills and uh, knowledge of the GDPR in order to take on that responsibility. The only people or organisations that need an official uh, data protection officer are public authorities and people who process data on a large scale um, or on a regular and do regular and systematic monitoring of um, personal data. So that would be things like um, behavioural tracking, profiling, automated decision making. If you're doing that on a large scale, you need a data protection officer in place. Um, and the other one is if you process criminal uh, convictions or offences. The um, person who you put in charge of looking after GDPR for your business needs to be independent and it's a, a requirement of GDPR if you've got a data protection officer, as in an officially designated DPO, um, that that person is independent. So they can independently of the senior management in the organisation um, influence how GDPR, how you comply with GDPR. Um, or it just you have to do it, or you can outsource yeah. it. Um, so that is one. No, <laughs> it, it's not. Um, so the independence thing is only a requirement if you've got an official. As a one-man band, you do not need uh, an official data protection officer. Right, okay. So it's just you. But if you had an official DPO, then they need to be 
um, they, they have to operate independently. Um, so, for example, a DPO could not get sacked by um, the business because the DPO is saying, right, you've got to do this, this and this in order to comply with GDPR. So from that, that basis, they've got to be independent and they've got to have um, enough resources and other things in a, to, to enable them to do their jobs properly. Okay, task two. This is probably the biggest and most critical thing um, of the whole planning process, which is to do um, a data audit. There are many ways that you can do a data audit, and a lot of people like to do it visually. And these are just some examples that I've pulled off of um, Google. Um, you can make it... I would encourage you all to do it as simply as possible. Um, you do not need fancy tools or software to do data flow diagrams. You can do it, if you want, on the back of a, an envelope if you're a one-man band. So long as you do it, that's the important thing, because it forces you to think about what data you, you, you are holding for um, individuals and how you process it, who's got access to it, and what you do with it. And are you only processing it um, for strictly necessary purposes? If, you, if you're holding data that you'd never use, you shouldn't have it. Um, so the other way to do a data audit is to ask all of these questions, and you could map it into a spreadsheet. Um, this is slightly hard to read, but basically this is uh, what, when and where, um, working out what data you've got, maybe by operational systems within your business. So you look at your HR data, um, you look at your uh, CRM, customer relationship management systems, um, and you go through each of those systems and work out how is that data coming into your business, where is it coming in from, maybe your website, maybe phone calls and working out what your legal basis is for holding that data. Every single bit of data needs to have a legal basis to be held in, in your business. You can group uh, similar data together. Um, so, for example, all employee data um, for doing payroll, you might categorise that as uh, holding that for one particular purpose. Um, <coughs> Part of uh, your obligation is to make sure that you don't hold data for any longer than is necessary. So when you're doing your data audit, you need to look at how long are you going to keep that data for? How long do you actually need it for? Um, and for each kind of category that you've got of personal data, you need to start thinking about how you're going, what your retention policy is going to be for that data. For some people who process data and they've got um, uh, their legal basis for holding it is under a legal obligation, there will be defined limits. Um, so, you know, it could be seven years if you're holding accountancy type data, um, that sort of thing. Right. The third step um, is to review uh, your data protection and security measures. So once you've worked out what data you've got, how you're holding it, you need to make sure that only um, the people who need access to it have got access to it. And I believe that Paul is going to talk more about how you can go about protecting that data to make sure that you don't have any data breaches and people don't leave data <coughs> on laptops, on trains and so on. <laughs> Task four. Okay, so um, once you've done all of that, you need to review your existing business processes and systems to make sure that you can, for example, handle a subject access request. Um, that you can, if somebody phones you up and says, um, I don't want to be on your mailing list anymore, how are you going to process that? You need to communicate to your whole team as well if you've got a team, um, what those processes are in order to remain compliant. Okay, notification. Um, this is a big thing under GDPR because once you know what you're going to do, how you're going to process data, uh, your legal basis for processing it, you need to notify um, all your data subjects 
um, what your legal basis is, how long you're going to keep their data for, and so on. So if you're um, capturing data as part of a, a legal contract because they're going to be a client of yours, then you might need to update your commercial terms and conditions of business to notify them of what particular data you're going to keep and why. So within those terms and conditions, you will probably need, you should need, um, a section about how you comply with um, the GDPR. Similarly, if you've got a website and you're capturing data through forms, or even if you're doing Google Analytics tracking, you need to notify people that you're collecting personal data about those visitors. At the moment, um, there are uh, the cookie laws, and you are supposed to put up a, a cookie notice that you are using cookies, but it, you're going to have to notify people and make it much clearer um, and easier for them to understand what information you're collecting and how you're processing it, and inform them of their rights as to how they can object, how they can um, have their data um, uh, be kept up to date, made accurate, um, and I'm going to come on to subject access requests in a bit. Um, right, so that's privacy notices. Okay. Capturing consent. Uh, if you get a phone call and somebody wants to join your mailing list, don't just add them to your MailChimp list. You need to record um, how and who put them on that list. Um, <coughs> my advice would be that rather than do that over the phone, I would probably ask them to go to your website or send them an email with a link to how they can sign up to your mailing list. Because that way, um, it will get captured, um, because most of the email campaign tools will capture that date stamp it, and you can see where it's come from. It's much more reliable, and it's an easier way to prove you're compliant. Yeah. Could I go in, sign them up? They would then get an email to say, I'm yes. a group. Yes. Yep. Yep, that's <coughs> correct. Um, okay. So if you have got a team of people, and even if you're a one man band, it is likely that you will use other people um, who will be using some of the data that you've got that is personal data. Um, so if you outsource payroll, for example, they will be um, processing your personal data. You need to make sure that they are compliant with GDPR as well. Um, if you've got somebody taking um, telephone calls for you because you outsource that, they actually need to be aware about GDPR. So you need to check all of those business processes um, and make sure that your staff, whoever they are, whether they're internal or external, are complying with GDPR. If um, a complaint comes through, they need to know how to handle it. So um, there are lots of resources that are available online that are free that might help you um, to train your staff to make sure that they're aware of what GDPR is and what their responsibilities are within your organisation to help you to help your business comply. So, for example, you're all here today, and hopefully you'll go away having learnt something. Um, I would start having a, a GDPR log and start recording the training that you've done, whether it's for you or your staff. If you go back and you then um, tell your colleagues about GDPR and what they've got to do, and when you start doing your data audits, write down in a log when you've done it, what you've done, so that if something happens and you've got to prove that you've been um, doing best practice, that you can demonstrate it. Okay, that's pretty much about recording uh, <coughs> compliance. Okay, um, the documentation thing, if your company has more than 250 employees, then it is a legal requirement to do the documentation um, to prove your compliance. 
If you've got less than 250 employees, you don't have to, but it will, in general, help you to comply um, because it forces you to go through the best practice routes. Okay. Responding to these three things is critical <coughs> because, as I've said, if you do this well, then nothing's going to get through to the ICO. They're not going to come after you, basically. Um, so the first one is handling subject access requests. Um, subject access requests can be really, really tedious um, because they can request every bit of data that you hold on them. That includes going through emails as well. And if you can imagine that with some people that you've had communications <coughs> with over a number of years, that could be thousands and thousands of emails. So you really, at all costs, want to avoid that. That type of subject access request is most likely to come from a, a disgruntled employee, um, less likely to come from um, somebody, uh, a, a prospect or a client um, or a supplier, but it could. Um, so to handle those, um, you need a, a system for recording what you're doing and when you do it. And you have to, um, I'll just check my notes, but I think you have to respond within a month to those uh, requests. Now, if somebody persistently makes subject access requests, then you can refuse on the grounds that it is excessive and I think unreasonable is the unfounded, that's the word, unfounded or excessive, you can object to it. If you say, no, we're not going to um, uh, give you um, access as you've requested, then you've got to tell that person why and the grounds for your objection. If they still think that, if they think that's unfair, they could then take that to the ICO and the ICO will then investigate. However, <coughs> the ICO is not going to investigate every single complaint. They expect businesses to handle those complaints and to try and resolve them themselves. Um, data subjects, individuals have three months from the last point of uh, communication with a business to take their complaint to the ICO. So, um, as I've said before, the best thing you can do is to try and resolve them and... Um, yeah. yeah. Um, no, is the answer, unless it is unfounded and unreasonable. So if somebody repeatedly asks for information and really they've got no basis for requesting it, um, then you can make uh, a charge. But again, you'd have to explain why you're doing that. And they do it historically, so from like five years ago? Yes. So it, uh, it's, from, it's from basically from now, but your, the data that you've got for them could be going back historically. Yeah, so it would apply to all that data. So again, you need to make sure that you've got good retention policies. Get rid of anything that you do not need would be my advice. If it's not useful, don't keep it. It could be both. So in the case of an employee, um, you, you need to look at the reason why they're going to make a complaint. So if they think they've been dismissed unfairly um, or they've been harassed, then potentially, yes, they're going to request to see every single email where they're mentioned between other people within the organisation because that could all impact on a, a harassment case. Well, they, so, so that would be unfounded. You know, they've got no reason to request that information. So you could object on that basis. But I would try, and, and uh, you know, if, if it's an employee, 
um, you know, is it a potential HR issue? So I'll try to get to the bottom as to why they're asking that question in the first place. Uh, not as far as I know. Um, so you could just send all the emails one by one, a bit like when people want to pay a fine in a penny, and really annoy, <laughs> you know, like the parking fine or whatever, and annoy them back by just doing it individually. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so there are a couple of things that you can do um, to uh, kind of protect data in some ways, um, but also to keep some information, say from a business or a school perspective, that you might need. So you might have a contractual obligation to keep records if you're a school, particularly results, for example. But you can do things like anonymise the data. So if you've anonymised the data and there's no way of associating it back to a particular individual, then that's job done. It is not, that data is then not under GDPR. Um, there's a halfway house called pseudonymisation, um, which is basically where you've taken out um, the immediate things that can identify a piece of data with an individual, but if you then put it back with some other data that you've kept over here, you can then identify the person. So that's sort of a halfway house, um, and that's one way of uh, protecting data, which I'm not sure if Paul's going to talk about in a moment. Um, I'll move on, because I know we've got a Q&A session at the end. Um, so any other questions, maybe I'll take at the end. Okay, so that's subject access requests. Personal data breaches. Um, you need to notify the ICO within 72 hours if you have uh, a data breach, so if data um, leaks out. Um, if there is a high risk to the individuals involved, then you've also got to notify them directly. Um, and handling complaints, I think we've talked about quite a bit, so I'll move on. Again, once you've done all of this, um, you need to keep doing it. Keep, if you put in a new system, um, then you're going to need to look at how does that impact um, your processing of personal data. Um, and it may be that you need to do data protection impact assessments. Um, there are guidelines on the ICO website as to when you need to do those, but basically that's looking at um, if there is going to be, if, if the type of data that you're processing is, um, if you mishandle it, then there, if there's going to be a potential risk to the individual in that they're going to be impacting in a negative way, then you need to do an impact assessment to determine how you can handle their data and safeguard their data um, the best practised uh, style. Um, I think data protection impact assessments mainly apply to larger organisations where you're processing a lot of data or if you're processing sensitive data. Um, so sensitive data would be things such as um, health records, anything to do with um, political um, opinions, religious beliefs, um, uh, ethical uh, origins, that sort of thing. Okay, I'm going to move on now to how GDPR um, will affect uh, businesses, the way businesses market themselves, uh, particularly from a digital point of view because that's one of the reasons the, data, the General Data Protection Act has come into force is because technology has moved on rapidly and the old uh, laws have not kept a pace. Um, one point to mention is that although uh, we are obviously going to uh, be coming out, uh, we're going to go through Brexit, GDPR is going to be incorporated under the new Data Protection Bill. Um, that's going through Parliament at the moment and I presume it will be out and in force probably by the 25th of May. But that will incorporate everything in the GDPR. Uh, right, so 
I said we'd come back and talk about consent and legitimate interest basis because those are the two where, um, are that are most relevant when you're doing marketing. Um, consent, um, you've got to comply with these particular things on the left-hand side when you rely on consent as your legal basis for processing data. Um, so, it's, so when you ask for that consent, it's got to be very specific, it's got to be for a specific purpose it's got to be very clearly communicated, so your notifications on your websites need to be in clear, plain language. If you are dealing with children, then the language has got to be even simpler. If you're dealing with children who are under 13, then you need to ascertain their age, uh, verify their age, and you will need to get parental consent. Um, the consent basis is very granular, meaning that... Um, if you are collecting uh, consent so that you can email them about a particular event or s type of event, then you must only use their data for that purpose. You can't then um, email them about a completely different event because you've suddenly decided that your business is going to enter into a new marketplace. You would have to get consent for that um, separate purpose. Um, when you're getting consent, um, if you made it very clear that you were going to email them about this, this, this and this, then you could tick the box on consent because you've made it clear. Um, you've also got to make sure that it's very easy for people to withdraw their consent. So with the email campaign tools that you have um, these days, it's all built into those systems. So every time you send an email out through an email campaign tool, it will have an unsubscribe button at the bottom, uh, be it for that specific list or for all lists. So one of the key things when you're thinking about marketing is to think about how you're going to manage your lists because you may well have different lists for different types of marketing when you're targeting people for different uh, services. So for example, business clients, we do lots of different things. We do marketing, HR, we do accountancy and bookkeeping, um, we do web design and IT, CRM systems. So if we wanted to market our services um, to a, a customer under, um, let's say, legitimate, I um, legitimate interest, because we've worked with them, they're one of our um, clients for whom we've done some marketing work, we could not just send them without their consent an email about our other services. That wouldn't um, come under legitimate interest. There might be some situations where we could get around that if we'd been very, very clear up front about all our services and we were 100% confident that they knew that we did all of those services. But from my experience, I know that a lot of our clients don't know quite how much we do. So um, that would be a bit tricky. Um, there's also got to be uh, no detriment to the individual. That means that you can't offer something for free on the basis that they give consent to join your mailing list because that would not be freely given consent. Uh, a lot of people are doing that at the moment and, and, and that's... So what are you saying? No legal adverts anymore? Sorry, no legal? Legal adverts. You've got to be very careful how you do those. So... If you're, so have you got a specific example? Well, let's say if somebody wants to get hold of the audio <coughs> or see the call or a free checklist or whatever, and in return they give their email address, how does that kind of work? Is that relevant? You say that it's not that Right, so <coughs> when the legal expert comes, you can ask them. My viewpoint would be that um, <coughs> I, I personally wouldn't do it. Um, I would make it uh, very clear that you would like to, them to uh, join your emailing list and give them a nice big box to tick. Um, maybe you could have that box there so that, and it's pre-ticked, but quite honestly, you're not allowed, you know, the ICO says that you're not allowed to have pre-ticked boxes. Um, you might get away with it, because let's, let's think, this is all a risk-based approach, okay? Um, you just don't want to have any complaints. So if I want a free, if, if it's called a free report, it should be free. Um, you should not have to give your consent in order to get that free report. 
call it something else and not free, then maybe that would be acceptable. But if somebody's selling me something sorry, that's free, I would, not have, I would not expect to have to give my consent to join a mailing list. That, that would be fine because you could do that under legitimate interest basis. Um, however, you've got to make it very easy for them to opt out and what you really need to do is that it's that first point of contact that is critical. Okay? So if they've changed from being a prospect to a client, when they become a client, then I would communicate with them to say, um, now you're a client, um, we feel that you would be interested in our, some of our other services, um, we have put you on our emailing list to receive notifications about those other services and discounts, blah, blah, blah. And at the same time, give them the opportunity to uh, unsubscribe. Okay, so in that instance, what about the prospects where they're not actually making funds, but they could be keen to buy from you, but they're not very interested in the service that you offer? Okay. So, so let's say we've met today, uh, you think I might be interested in your services, then um, and I've given you my business card, or even if we haven't, you look me up and you contact me. Um, as soon as we start engaging, you then are, invite me to, to join your mailing list. That needs to be the process. Because if the, the way to think about it is turn it the other way around. If you were the person being put on somebody else's list, would you object to it? If, if you feel that you would object to it, then it's not right. One thing I would say is that a lot of this has not been tested out. Um, so the key thing is try and avoid um, getting any complaints. <laughs> um, keep a record of what you're doing. Um, legitimate interest. Um, if you are going to use legitimate interest as your basis for marketing, then you need to do a balancing test. So that's um, what that means is balancing your legitimate business rights to communicate and do marketing with prospects, clients, etc. Um, against the individual rights of the, uh, the people who you're communicating with. Um, again, it's all a bit woolly, it's not black and white, unfortunately. Um, and with legitimate interest, people still have the right to object. Okay, there are um, a couple of uh, instances where legitimate interest is not available. If it's going to uh, negatively impact an individual, in particular, if you do any sort of differential pricing, where because you know somebody lives in SW19 in Wimbledon Village, you're going to put your price up. That would negatively impact them. You cannot do that under GDPR. Um, if you're processing sensitive data, you have to have consent. You cannot use that data under a legitimate interest basis. Um, and you need to remember that cookie laws still apply. The cookie laws have been around since 2003. They keep getting updated. The regulation is uh, PECRA, Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations. Um, I'll come on to that in a little bit. Right, cookies. So, this is quite interesting because the ICO um, has kind of said, well, this is theory and this is practice. So, um, in some cases, they say that implied consent um, will actually be a more practical option than explicit consent. This is particularly so um, with regard to cookies. So nearly everybody who's got a website will be placing cookies. If you use Google Analytics, there are cookies on your website. You are tracking people. You are um, tracking um, their uh, computer IDs, and you can do various things with that information. Um, so what <coughs> happens in practice, um, the ICO may well overlook. So they haven't come out with guidance on all of this yet. Um, so that's why I think businesses need to take a risk-based approach to complying with GDPR. Um, however, this does not apply in the case of sensitive data. You've got to be very careful when you're using sensitive data. Um, so here, the ICO is saying that they are highly unlikely 
where there is a low level of intrusiveness on the individual, i.e. it's not really going to significantly impact the individual, they are very unlikely to take action against anybody. Facebook pixels. Is anybody using Facebook pixels on their website? Um, doing remarketing? Okay. So, uh, under GDPR, theoretically, you need consent to be able to do that. How do you get that? You know, if you're going to tell somebody, um, I'm going to put a Facebook pixel on your website, that's, that pixel is going to track you even after you've left my website, and then I'm going to serve up a, uh, an advert to you later on. Well, most people would opt out. Now, the way I think this is all going to go is that, um, a bit like the cookie law, everybody is now very used to seeing that cookie uh, pop up and people just click on it, they don't even bother reading the privacy information or anything, and they just get on with using the website. Now, so long as you've got your terms and conditions of use on your website, you've got a, um, a good privacy notice on your website, you make it very clear what you're using people's data for, if you say in that pop-up thing that you are going to be uh, targeting visitors to your website, uh, with adverts, then actually I don't think the ICO is going to come down on you hard. The ICO is not going to stop businesses from doing business at the end of the day. Everything would just stop. And also, you know, all the big boys would stop getting all their money in and they're not going to want to do that either. The ICO is not going to crack down on that. Um, okay. So if you are doing anything like... Uh, uh, remarketing using Google AdWords, Facebook pixels, if you, if you do LinkedIn advertising, then you need to be, make, make sure that your notices to users um, are very clear, um, accessible, and tell them how they can opt out of being tracked. So, uh, I think this is my next slide. Yeah, so one of the ways people can opt out is uh, you can tell them how to do it through their browsers so they can turn off all, all the cookie tracking, etc. I think what's going to happen is that a lot of these website browsers, they're going to have to change the way that they do this. They're going to have to make it more accessible for people to turn these things off. Uh, this is how you get to the cookies on Google Chrome. That's about four levels down, and it's pretty hard to find. Even I can't remember how to find it half the time. Okay, the other way that you could help your... Uh, visitors to your website to manage this and to be able to opt out is by using a cookie management system. There are hundreds around. The ICO uses this one in the middle called Civic. Um, there is a free version of it um, which basically um, helps you to provide the notices that you need to inform <coughs> your visitors uh, about their rights and how to object, blah, blah, blah. Um, but there's also a paid version and some, with some of the paid versions you can almost go through one by one and turn off various cookies. Okay, so options for remarketing. Um, I would recommend taking a risk-based approach. Um, make sure visitors understand their rights, um, how they can complain, um, and consider a cookie management system if you're doing a lot of behavioural tracking in particular. Okay, key takeaways. Um, doing nothing is not an option, it's the law, you've got to comply. If you don't, there are heavy fines. Transparency is the key thing about all of this. Those notifications um, on the website are really, really key. That is one of the key ways that you can prove that you are complying with GDPR. Um, compliance is an ongoing task, this is not a one-off thing. Every time your business processes change or you take on a new employee, you need to train them. Uh, and tell them about GDPR and how they uh, help in making sure that you are compliant. It is not black and white. So, if there's one thing that I would like you to take away from all of this, it's the last thing. Put the privacy rights of the individuals first and handle complaints well. Um, if you want a recap on all of this and a bit more detail, um, you can go to our resource on our website, businessclan.com forward slash GDPR. Thank you.